Hello everybody, I'm Catherine from the Sewing Studio at Lady Lake in the Sewing Studio Fabric Superstore. Today we're going to talk about how to use your brand new Brother LB5000S, which stands for Star Wars, or LB5000M, which stands for Marvel. This way you can get the most out of your machine. Let's get started. Okay, so let's talk about the included accessories. First of all, you get a soft cover, which is going to protect your machine from dust. You get your foot pedal. You have an embroidery hoop that's a four by four size and the included positioning template for it. You've got an accessory pouch, which is going to hold all of your feet. You've got your buttonhole foot, your button fitting foot, your standard J presser foot, your G foot for overcasting, your R foot for blind hems, your N foot for decorative stitching, your I foot for zippers. Also, because this is an embroidery machine, you have your embroidery foot. Now, you also get an ankle or a presser foot holder, which is the piece that you're gonna to use to hold on all all of your sewing feet. You also have a thread net to help you manage fussy threads, metallic threads, or threads that just give you grief. This keeps them in check. You've got a pack of needles that has variety sizes and shapes and purposes in it. You've got your twin needle pack. They also gave you this wonderful included faceplate accessory where you can choose to stick this on the faceplate of your machine. This is the Star Wars version, but the LB5000M has Marvel. So that's a nice little accessory. Also in there, you've got scissors, you've got a little lint brush, as well as a stylus, your seam ripper, and you have four spool caps. Yes, that's right, four of them. So you have your mini spool king, which is gonna go into embroidery threads and styles of thread that kind of are shaped like this. So it simply inserts right down into the spool, holding the spool in place. You have your small, medium, and large spool caps, which is for your normal size spools that you have for your normal sewing thread. You have empty bobbins, as well as uh, 60 weight pre-wound embroidery bobbins, which you would use in the bottom of your embroidery. You have an auxiliary spool pin for when you're doing twin needle sewing. And then you have some tools here this is your awl. Your awl has a hole punch here at the end, and you can also put cord through the awl and pull it through when you come back through your where you've just poked your hole. You have a screwdriver slash hoop driver to help you tighten and loosen your hoop screws. And you have a disc shaped screwdriver, which is really good for inserting your needles as well as getting your uh, needle plate off the machine when it's time to clean it. And you have your accessory bin for when you're in sewing. This is gonna get inserted on the front side of your machine and you'll simply open it and you can stash all your feet in there and close it. This piece is your embroidery unit. This is the embroidery unit that you would install when it's time to go ahead and start embroidering. There is on the bottom side of the unit, this little lever in here, which has a, which you pinch. There's actually a latch on the inside right here, this little gray latch. So when you are pinching that, it allows you to snap on and click off your embroidery unit onto the machine while you're doing your embroidery. So the first thing you need to do while you're beginning your embroidery process is start by hooping up your stabilizer and your project. So let's talk about the hoop and how to use it. Okay, so first of all, you're gonna be laying your hoop on a flat surface and you'll begin by loosening the hoop screw here at the bottom of the hoop. You'll remove your inner ring and set it aside. Okay, at this point, you're gonna lay your stabilizer over your hoop. Now, before I do that, I just wanna point out that at the top of the inner ring, there's a little arrow which points away from you. That arrow is going to line up with the outer ring arrow. So let's get our stabilizer situated and laid over our hoop. And we can also take our fabric and lay that over it as well. I like to start by kind of sliding the uh, hoop, the inner ring towards the outer ring top, and then go ahead and push it in. At that point, you're gonna wanna kind of um, pull your fabric just a little bit. You don't wanna stretch it. You just wanna get rid of any excess looping and puckering and um, wibbles in your fabric so that you get it nice and straight. 
Okay, one of the things that you're going to need to take advantage of when you go to hoop something is that you've got a positioning template that came with your machine. So the positioning template has little notches in it at the top and at the bottom. So those little notches are going to lay right into and attached on the little notches that are at the top and bottom of your hoop. This allows you to put a little pinpoint precision mark with your friction pen or chalk or whatever you'd like to do on the east, west, north, and south to give yourself a crosshair for positioning properly. And that's about it. The last thing you need to do is remember to go ahead and tighten your hoop screw. So you're just going to get where you can tighten it up where it's got a pretty, pretty good grip on the inside of the hoop. You don't want it so loose that this inner ring is just gonna flop out. It needs to be able to help be held nice and steady inside your hoop. And that's about it. Okay, so to install the embroidery unit, you're gonna begin by making sure your machine is turned off. In order to connect and remove electronic components, you wanna do that while there's no current or charge running through them. So turn the machine off. Then in order to install the embroidery arm, you're simply going to slide it right onto the machine until it clicks. In order to remove the embroidery unit, all you need to do is reach your hand underneath the embroidery arm, the end of it. There is that little clicker I talked about earlier. You're gonna pinch it and then pull out the embroidery unit. So again, I did that by pinching this little gray lever in here inside the unit. To install your hoop, you're gonna simply nice and low and flat slide your hoop underneath your embroidery foot. You're gonna line up the two mounting brackets with the two receptacles, simply lift it up, place them into those holes, and then at that point you can snap down your hoop. To remove your hoop, you're going to push your project out of the way. Right here you've got a little pinching area, so you're gonna pinch that back, it's gonna release the hoop. You'll reach back behind your hoop and lift up and slide your hoop out. Okay, let's talk about winding a bobbin and how to do that. So first of all, you're gonna start by installing your spool of thread onto the spindle. The way that they recommend it with Brother is that the thread is actually coming from the bottom of the spool. That's very important in terms of how the thread comes to the machine. However, if you have an old spool of thread where you've got the notch carved into the plastic, you're going to make sure that that is the other direction on this end. Okay, so you've got your spool engaged onto the machine, and then you're going to go ahead and use your matching size spool cap to hold it into position. At this point, we need to pass our thread into this little hook right here. This is the first thing that we need to do, and that's indicated with the number one. So you're gonna pop it in there just kind of like you're flossing your teeth. So that's number one. Then you're going to come behind this little arm here. That's number two. This is where we start behind the back of the machine. Now, right here, we need to engage this area. This area is kind of funny in terms of the fact that we're gonna make the letter Z. We're gonna start behind this little post, and then we have to scooch right back in between this post and this disc, and then we're gonna swing around under the disc. So let me show you how I do that. First of all, I start by holding my thread back here so I've got a little bit of tension on it. So again, there's that post and I'm passing behind it. Then I have to be pass between that post and this disc. Then I need to swing around under the disc in order to have that properly tensioned out before I wind my bobbin. Okay, from there, we're gonna head straight over to our bobbin. Now with this particular bobbin, it doesn't matter. There's no upside down, right side up. It doesn't even matter. You're just gonna push your bobbin on and spin it until it clicks. Let me do that one more time so you can hear it. Push the bobbin down and spin it until it clicks into position. Okay, your thread is going to pass behind the bobbin first and then travel clockwise five or six times. Once you have that wrapped around there, you're going to then take your thread and pass it into this little cutout right there where it's gonna take the razor that's there and cut that excess thread so it has pinched and it's holding the excess thread for you. 
At that point, you need to come down here and slow your machine down for the winding. And this is orange to indicate that it's ready to wind the bobbin and you select that bobbin winding button. When you're happy with what you've got, you can reach up and select stop and it will stop winding the bobbin. You can disengage your bobbin at that point and because the cutter is already there, I generally lift my bobbin up and I take my thread and just pass it right back through that cutter and now I've got my bobbin ready to install. Okay, so to install the thread onto your machine, you'll simply put the spool of thread onto your spindle. And this type of spool, again, requires the little mini spool cap. So you slide that right in. Once you've done that, your thread automatically comes off the bottom of the spool. And we start by clicking it into this little metal hook area, which is labeled as number one. Okay. It's a bit like flossing your teeth. You've gotta go ahead and click it into place like I just did right there. Now we're going to pass the thread behind this little hook. So again, we're gonna sweep it in and pass it behind the hook. Okay, at this point, I like to hold my finger on the thread up here by where the handle is, just so that I've got some tension on my thread. At this point, the thread is going to pass straight down. We're gonna make a U-turn here where it says number three. Once you've made that U-turn, we're gonna head straight back up. At the top of the machine, it indicates number four. Number four starts on the right, goes all the way back and swings around to the left. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna head straight up, starting from the right side, swinging back around to the left side, and then down. Right here is number five, so we're gonna pass by number five. Now at this point, right here, we have number six. This is the needle bar. And on top of the needle bar, there's a little piece of metal. So the thread needs to pass between the needle bar and that piece of metal. So again, if you've got some tension on your thread, this is very helpful. So now we're gonna take it and slide it into place. Okay, so from there, we're going to pass up towards number seven. So you kind of pass in between this little slitted area and up into number seven. It clicks into number seven on the far left-hand side. Over here on the side of the machine, you have a razor blade. So the thread is going to come up and around that razor blade, and you're just gonna pull on it to cut any excess thread. The last thing you need to do is thread it with the number nine lever. So this is where we're gonna push down the number nine lever to thread the eye of the needle. Before you do that, go ahead and put your foot down and then reach back over to number nine lever and thread the needle. What it's done is put a little loop of thread to the back, which you can then pull. So now you've got your nice little threaded needle. To install your bobbin, begin by pulling this little rectangle to the right as indicated by the arrow that's going to snap up your bobbin cover. Remove that to the side for a second and place your bobbin down into the machine. Now, in order to make sure that your bobbin is installed correctly, you wanna pull the thread to the right and make sure that those little bubbles that are on top of the bobbin are spinning in a counterclockwise fashion. I like to then put my finger on top of the bobbin and very tightly swing that thread across underneath this arm. Right around here is where the tension is, so make sure you pull it nice and tight into that and then up and around the mountain and then there's a little razor blade right there. So you'll pull the thread to the right. It's gonna cut any excess bobbin thread. Then you're going to take your bobbin cover with the little notch and it goes underneath this little metal tab and simply push it down to snap it back into position. So to transition from sewing to embroidery, we're gonna remove our sewing foot and install our embroidery foot. We'll begin by releasing whatever presser foot you have on the machine by depressing this black button in the back, squeezing it towards the front. Go ahead and remove that foot. Now we need to remove this ankle piece right here. This presser foot is the portion that always holds almost all of the sewing feet right here. So we're gonna start by loosening our bolt Righty tighty, lefty loosey, and your ankle is just going to fall off. So in order to install the embroidery foot, we're going to pass the bolt into this portion of the embroidery foot and then spin it around this shaft right here. So let's see how that's done. I'm gonna start 
right there and I've got it into position and sometimes I find it helpful just to jiggle it a little bit from the presser foot up and down so that I can install this. Now at this point I need to go ahead and tighten my bolt. Again, lefty loosey, righty tidy. Once you've finger tightened it, go ahead and get your disc shaped screwdriver and finish tightening that all the way. Embroidery is one of my favorite things in the world. So I'm gonna talk about how to use your embroidery section of your LB 5000 MRS. Okay, let's get started. So right on the faceplate of the machine, you see here your home button for embroidery. When you have the embroidery unit installed, and you turn the machine on, it wakes up with this section available on the screen for your options and your selection. I wanna start by talking about this right here. Notice that there's a button here and there's a message from the machine that says, always press when removing the embroidery unit. So when you select this button, it gives you a message, a warning message that the carriage of the embroidery unit is going to move, keep your hands away. All you have to do is select okay. And what that does is move the arm out of position and where that is a safe place for the arm to be held while you are installing and removing the embroidery unit. Okay, so in order to select a design, you've got several different areas that you can choose from. I'm going to start by selecting this section right here. It gives me a message, my unit's going to move back in and you can scroll through your designs. As you scroll through your designs, you use your hands on this portion of the machine and you can use a stylus on this section of the machine. So I'm gonna scroll through and try and see if I can find a design that's small and directional with quite a few colors. Ooh, that looks like the perfect one. So as you can see here, I have scrolled through to the eighth page of nine pages of little thumbnails of embroidery designs to pick from. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that design. When I do, right away the screen gives me a little bit of information which is kind of important. First of all, this tells me that I cannot use my smallest hoop, the little micro hoop that is available for purchase. It's an optional accessory. That's a really good small hoop for like little tiny baby things. This right here is an indication of the 4x4 hoop, telling me that this design is suitable for the 4x4 hoop. Also, right at the top of the screen, I can see that this design is 1.91 inches tall by 3.60 inches wide. That's indicated by the first number. The number that's on top is there by the height. And over here, this one, the second one down, is indicative of the width. So if I select a different design, now I've got different information. Right away it tells me this little cocktail glass is 2.48 inches tall by 1.17 inches wide. So I'm gonna go back to my little flip-flops hanging on the line, and I'm going to go ahead and set them onto my editing screen. Once I set this design to my editing screen, I've got a whole new set of editing options. This is our primary editing page. The first thing that you see, again, is the same amount of information that you've got from before. You don't, you can't do this on your little tiny hoop. You can only do it within your 4x4 and that this design is 1.91 inches tall by 3.60 inches wide. Right here, you have a magnifying glass with a little plus mark on it. Plus indicates zooming in. So when you select that option, I have the ability to zoom in and look at my design. Let's say I want to zoom in 250%. Now this lets me scroll to the right or scroll to the left and see the different sections of my design. Let's take it back to 100% and select OK. Another way to zoom, on your, to zoom in on your design, the way that I actually prefer, is I love this icon right here. These are stitches inside of a hoop. So when you select this button, it shows you what the stitches look like in a realistic rendering, kind of like a 3D rendering of the design. So that's kind of actually what it's going to look like as it's stitched. If I was to zoom out, and that's with the negative mark, this gives me a sense of perspective. What does this design feel like within a 4x4 hoop? Once I have checked everything out, made sure I'm okay with it, I'm gonna go ahead and select okay. All right, so the first editing button we have here is move. You can select your design on screen 
and simply slide it up or down or to the right or to the left. But I don't find a high level of precision with that because I do things like, you know, breathe. So I like to select move and from my movement key, if I select my dead center and I want the design to go straight up, all I have to do is touch my straight up button and it's going to move it straight up. If I was to do that on the screen, I probably wouldn't get it into position properly. If I was to slide my design down and hold it there in the middle, there's no way I'm going to be able to get it right in the dead center. I just move too much. But if I touch my dead center dot, there it indicates that I'm back at dead center. Okay, so one thing to point out is that everything up and to the right of center is going to have positive values and everything down and to the left of center is going to have negative values. So there I've touched my dead center dot bringing my design back to the dead center and I'm going to go ahead and select OK to get out of this window. Your second editing option is size. When you select size, you've got wonderful four-way sizing as well as two-way sizing. And by sizing in these different ways, you can really make a difference in how your design appears. I can make the whole thing smaller, indicated by the four arrows squeezing the design down. So now I've gotten down to 171 tall by 324 wide, or you can make the whole thing bigger by the four arrows pushing out on the walls. And that's as big as I can go. I've actually filled the hoop there. This is a wonderful little button that says, ah, all right, just let me go back to the beginning. It's a reset button. So when you select that, it brings you back to how your design was originally brought into the machine. You can also make your design shorter, taller, skinnier, and wider. Sometimes you'll have a large or medium or small option available as well. Okay, let's get out of sizing. Now you have rotate, that's your third editing option. You can rotate by 90s, by 10s, or by 1s. So if I wanted to go 45 degrees to the right, I would simply touch my 10 degree to the right button, that's 10 degrees, and now it jumped to 80. Why did it jump to 80? It jumped to 80 because this design is too wide to go more than 10 degrees. It had to jump to 80 degrees to compensate for the way that I was rotating it. Reset is always a good button. It gets you right back to where you started at your normal way of looking at it, the default parameters. As you rotate also, the degrees of rotation are indicated here at the top left hand corner. So if I was to rotate two degrees to the right, I can see I'm two degrees to the right. And that little circle with the arrow is indicating that this is how we're spinning or rotating the design and reset brings you back to how you brought it in. Okay. Your fourth editing option is to change the colors of the design. So this is very valuable in terms of painting the screen with the colors that you wanna line up and use. So when I select this icon, it brings me to my four pages worth of color palette. Now, let me back up for a second and talk about the fact that here in the main operational menu of the machine, when I select that, I can choose to look at this design in terms of the name of the color, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, or I could choose to look at the design in terms of color number. We carry Madeira Poly brand thread here at the store. So if I wanted the design to look exactly like I'm being told to have it, this is the number of the color that is from Madeira Poly. So now as I look at this, Instead of saying vermilion, like it did a minute ago, now it says Madeira Poly number 1779. I generally stay with name of color because I generally paint the screen with the colors that I want anyway. So there we have name of color and Madeira Poly. Color number would be valuable in terms of the fact that this is an LB5000S which is a Star Wars machine. So if I were stitching out a Baby Yoda, I might need to make sure that I've got the color number indicated so that I choose the proper green for exactly the color that's called for for that character. Just like Mickey's red shorts are a different color than Ariel's red hair, which is different than Merida's red hair. So color number would be much more important when you're selecting designs that are from Disney so that the colors are true to character. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Actually, let me go back to name of color. There we are, name of color. Okay, 
So here we have the first thing in the design that's going to stitch are the inside of the flip flops. And I can see that's um, there, 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 and there. And I can see that right here on the screen. Now, maybe I don't want red flip flops. Maybe I want to choose brown flip flops. Well, down here at the bottom, I can see that I've got four pages of color that I'm allowed to choose from. So this is my first page of my color palette. To get to the second page of the color palette, there's two ways that I can go about doing it. I can slowly take my time by scrolling to the right. So right now I'm gonna scroll to the right and I just went to black. It jumped up to the very first color of the very first page of the color palette. By scrolling to the right, it's changing those colors on screen in real time. So it went from vermilion to pink. So now I can choose my colors that way. Again, I'm on the first page of four pages of colors. So if I wanted brown flip-flops, I need to go to the next page. So again, I can scroll through it slowly but surely, or I can also indicate with these arrows down here. So I was on page one and now we're on page two. If I wanted to get to page three, I simply have to touch my right toggle button. That gets me over to my third page of color options. And then again, that takes me to the fourth page. So if I want to get to brown, the fastest way to get there would be to scroll back. There I am on page two, there are my browns and I can choose a nice reddish brown. Of course, I might not like that. So you have the ability to scroll through as you go along to get to the colors that you might want to get to. Okay, so now that I've got this tangerine chosen for the flip-flops, I can scroll to the next color in my design by using the plus spool. So that means I'm advancing to the next color. When I select that, this is the blue of the sunglasses. So perhaps I want my sunglasses to be black because I want them to be very dark. So right there inside the sunglasses, I can see the black now. I'm going to go ahead for one moment and select OK to get out of the color palette. Again, here, this option shows me my stitches in the hoop. So when I select that, now I can get an up close realistic view of black inside my sunglasses and the orange with the polka dots and the orange base here that I've chosen to do my flip flop colors in. If I'm good with that, I'm gonna go ahead and select okay to close my stitches looking at viewing option. And here I am back on my main screen. So again, I find that very helpful. You can paint the screen all the colors so that you can set your colors in front of you and go from color to color and you're ready to go. The next option you have is mirror imaging. You can see that over here, I've got a triangle facing one way. This orange flip-flop with the blue straps is on the right side. If I select my mirror imaging option, now the orange flip-flop is over there on the left. This mirror imaging becomes very valuable if I wanted to do this on two sofa cushions, let's say. I don't want both of my sofa cushions facing that direction. My designs would look kind of funny if they were all facing one way. So this way, by selecting mirror image, you can have one design facing one way and then spin it the other direction. That gives you the ability to do one design on one side of your sofa and then stitch the design without the mirror imaging for the other side of the sofa. So that's your mirror imaging option. Now here in this design, these two options are not available. They are grayed out. This tells me that I can't do this particular editing style with this design. Well, why is that? Actually, these are associated with fonts and we'll get to that in a bit. All right, if I wanted to select delete because I've decided I just don't wanna do this design, I would select delete and it would delete this out of the screen and take me back to my home screen. I don't wanna select that right now though. Select would let you move, um, move the design around. By touching select, it puts the red box around that design and makes sure that that's the design that you're currently working with. Now, over here, the next to last option is a red arrow pointing down into a pocket. This actually would save the design into the memory of the machine. So if you wanted to slide this up, you could do it right on screen, or like I said, you could select move, 
from the dead center go straight up. Now I've moved straight up, but I haven't gotten to the left or the right at all, which is exactly what I wanted. So if I want this so that I can stitch these flip-flops on four different towels for four different friends, I can actually save this design into my machine there in that position so that I know that I'm good to go so that once I'm done stitching my flip-flops, I can go in and add lettering underneath the bottom of my design so that I don't have to move it, move it, move it every time I go to stitch this design. So I find saving into the memory of the machine very valuable. When I'm done editing this design, let's just go ahead and take that back center. When I'm done editing this design, I'm gonna select edit end. When you're done editing, this is our final layout screen. So from this final layout and editing screen, I'm able to make any final adjustments to, to the design. Now this is where when you have marked your fabric with crosshairs and you know exactly where you wanna position your design, you can now nudge yourself into position properly. Notice that there's a little green crosshair at the dead center of the design right now. That's gonna tell me that my needle is hovering over the dead center of the design. So as I look to my hoop, I can check that this little center mark is lining up with exactly where I wanna line up on my hoop. Okay, so on this screen again, we've got our moving arrows here and everything is together. And if I select my north arrow, it moves my design up, my south arrow moves it down, etc. Now, if I need to check the left side and right side of my design, I don't wanna be moving the design to check it. So if I had purse straps and I needed this design to fit exactly within my left strap and my right strap, these are the two buttons that we're gonna to use to check if we're in the proper position. This um, particular button takes you to your nine points of positioning. And this also has to do with checking your bottom left hand, leftmost, bottommost portion of the design. So by selecting these different areas, you're able to check your positioning. Okay. This is my favorite way of looking at things though, because I can do two things from this one icon. When I select this icon, I can do a quick sweep around of the design. It's called a trial key or a trace key. I kind of think of it like the Pac-Man key because it walka walka walks around. Let's look at that in action. When I select the trial key, it runs across the bottom of the design, the top of the design, down the other side of the design and it restores back to center because I am on that dead center button. If I need to check the left strap that this design isn't sitting on the left strap, I could check the top left corner, the left center, and the bottom left corner. And I could check that against my top right corner, my right center, and my bottom right corner. When I'm done checking that I'm equidistant in between my two straps, I wanna go ahead and look back at center. I find it always helpful to restore back to center. So again, within your trial key right here, you have the ability to do a quick walk a walk a walk around, or you can check individually nine points of positioning. When you're done checking everything, you just select okay to get out of that window. You also have the option to save in this screen if you'd like to. Here in the secondary editing screen, your final layout screen, you also have the ability to rotate. This would become important if you were hooping and stitching on a towel. With a towel, you wouldn't want the entire bulk of your towel inside the neck of your machine. Usually you're gonna want the towel off to the left of your machine, so the bulk of it is draped dramatically over this left end of the machine. You don't want it hanging in the front so you don't pull on it by accident, and you don't want your towel hanging off the back so that it gets caught on something that you can't see back there. So if the base of my towel is inside the neck of the machine, that would mean that my design would need to rotate 90 degrees to the left so that it would stitch in the proper location on my towel. This is where you've got another rotate key here in your secondary layout screen. So you'd select 90 degrees to the left and you'd be good to go. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and keep it center. So I'm gonna select reset, which brings me back to my center horizontal orientation and I can select okay.
Okay, so if, at this point, if I'm good to go and ready to stitch it out, I'm gonna go ahead and select embroidery. Now it's moved us to our third and final screen for embroidery. So again, up here in the top left-hand corner, it tells me to use my four x four hoop. Over here, it tells me to make sure I have my embroidery foot on, the Q foot on. Next here at the top, you've got 6,137 stitches in this design, zero stitches of which I have completed. The design's going to take me roughly 16 minutes. I haven't done any of that, and it's gonna be 12 colors in this design, zero of which I've stitched. Okay, now here on the right, we can see that the first color in the design that's going to stitch is the tangerine. That's going to take me about two minutes to stitch, and I can see what that tangerine is here in this little preview area for what is about to be stitched. This icon right here is an icon which will turn off the cutting. So it starts by being selected, which means the cutting is engaged or turned on. If you select it, it turns off the cutting. That's honestly something I extraordinarily rarely ever do. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've done it but one time in 10 years. So let's leave that on. Right here, this is where we can navigate through our design. So let's just say that you had broken a thread. So let's pretend that we are a couple of colors into the design. So I'm going to advance just to show you how to do that. So we're here in the third color of the design, and let's pretend that we're six or seven stitches into the third color of the design, and I'm going to say OK to get out of this screen. So I'm going along, everything is perfect, and all of a sudden I broke my thread. Oh no, what do I do? Well, you're going to come to this icon right here. So you can see that it's dot, 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 which is stitches made by a needle, and there are less or more of them, negative being less, positive being more. So when you select that icon, you can navigate through your design. If I have advanced six stitches past my safe place and I broke my thread, now I can individually go back by six stitches or me personally, when I break a thread, I always like to go back about 20 stitches. So I'm gonna to touch negative 10 and negative 10. So I've just gone back 20 stitches. You can see that happening right there in the stitches on your machine that you've completed. You can also advance and retreat entire colors by a whole color back being negative or a whole color forward being positive. So I can navigate backwards or forwards. Or if I was to select zero, that of course would take me back to the very beginning of the design with zero stitches stitched. If I select OK, it closes this window. So that's a safety key that lets you go backwards and forwards when you break a thread or break a needle, or if you want to stitch something out or skip something, this lets you navigate behind or backwards or forwards, backwards or forwards or back to the beginning and always select OK to close any window that you've got. All right, let's talk about some of the other designs and other design editing features in the embroidery section of the machine. So I'm gonna select my home screen to take me back to my home screen and okay to let go of that design. So here I am on my home screen and we were just in one of the embroidery design folders or pockets. There are more designs in each section of this machine, including a large lettering font. When you actually select this, this is showing me that there's eight pages of font available here. If you go backwards, you can actually see that they have accent pieces that could go on with a lettering. So if I was to choose a letter, like the letter A, once that letter A was done stitching, I could rehoop my towel and then stitch a band across the band of my towel. So you've got some companion piece designs in that section as well. You also have your regular font section, and let's go there for talking about editing. So here I am in my regular fonts, there are two pages of them. These are the first six that are available to me. If I wanna to get to the second page, I cannot get there here. I need to go to my toggle arrows backwards and forwards down here on the face of my machine. So I'm gonna to select to get to the second page. And as you can see, these 
um, these three fonts are not in English. So if you want to choose those, you can always hit Google Translate. But let's go ahead and start with these first six fonts that we have available to us. I'm going to select stitch um, font number two. It's just a nice, clean, utility, old school type of font. So once I select that font, now it brings me to this first editing page for fonts. This is telling me that this is the line of text that I am about to start typing out and I'll be able to see that on the screen. So I have here, there's three little tabs here for three little sections of doing the fonts. This first tab shows that I've got uppercase and lowercase options here on this tab of editing. You can see that I go from A to the letter O. Well, where's the rest of the alphabet? Here on the right, I can see that I'm on my first of four pages. If I scroll to the right, I'm gonna use my toggle buttons down here on the face of my machine. This takes me to P through Z, and now I can start my lowercase. So as you scroll through, you can see you've got your uppercase and your lowercase all in this same tab here. And right here, we have the space button. So I'm gonna start by selecting the uppercase A. When I select my first letter, my name is Catherine, which is a very long name. So the first thing that I usually do is select medium because it's a lot easier to size up or down from medium than to stop and delete everything when it's all large or to grow it or make it bigger when I'm in small. So select your first letter and then select medium. The next thing that I do is I scroll over to get to the rest of my letters. Let's just do B, C, and D. If I'm good with that, I'm gonna go ahead and select set and put that on my screen. If I was doing multi-line text, I would also have the option of hitting enter and we'll go over that in a moment. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and select set. Once I've selected set, you'll see that these two icons are now available as editing options. This first icon is density. So if I was doing a towel, perhaps I might want to increase the density of my design. If I was doing like a baby onesie, which is really thin, swishy, wishy fabric, I could decrease the density of my design. Notice that there is no black background. Whenever you've moved away from your default, the black background disappears. But you don't have to panic if you want to find the de uh, default setting again. All you have to do is scroll through until you see that black background appear and now you know you're back on your default settings. Select OK to get out of this screen. The next button you have is your font editing button. This is a really cool button. In case you want to edit your fonts, you go into your font editing button. Okay, so these are your font editing options. Let's start here by H and V. You'll notice that that's grayed out. That's because we're not in one of those foreign fonts. Some fonts in some countries present their fonts in vertical writing or horizontal writing. So that's an option for those particular fonts. Over here, the first option that we have for English is our multicolor option. I actually love this feature for two reasons. First of all, kids love color. So if I wanted the A to be red and the B to be orange and the C to be yellow, etc., I could select multicolor and it would stitch the letter A and then pull it down and cut underneath and wait for me to change my thread to the next color, stitch the letter B, etc. But the reason that I prefer multicolor and it's my favorite thing ever is that when you select multicolor, it actually is going to cut the thread in between each letter. The second reason is that I love this feature, this multicolor feature, is that this machine doesn't trim between letters. It still leaves you with jump cuts. In other, from, in other words, from the A to the B and the B to the C and the C to the D, there are little threads left in between each letter as the machine jumps from letter to letter to letter. However, if I select multicolor, I'm kind of tricking the machine into thinking that it needs to cut after each letter. So when the letter A is complete, it pulls the thread down underneath and cuts for me. So at that point, all I have to do is raise my presser foot, clear my thread out from underneath, lower my presser foot and select my start button again. It would then stitch the letter B and cut for me. So I lift and clear 
and put my foot down and press start. And I gotta tell you, I find that's a lot faster for me with my glasses and my good lighting to actually get in there with my tiny little scissors and snip the little jump cuts in between each letter. So I love, love, love the multicolor feature. The next thing you have is array. A lot of people say, what is array? And I always tell people this. I, Catherine Conti, am a ray of sunshine. So what array does is it will smile your font or frown your font. It's a really cool feature. So let's look at what that does. So when I select array, I have several different kinds of array options. Again, if I want to smile my font, I can select a gentle smile, or I can select a deep smile, or I can frown my font, or I can really frown my font. I can also, once I've selected something, I can actually push it out a little bit or pull it in a little bit. The same thing goes with the smiling. If I've smiled it, I can push it out and make it a little bit less of a curve or bring it in and make it more of a curve. So this allows you to put your fonts on an array. This icon right here is also what I like to consider like a Ferris wheel in terms of the fact that when you're on a Ferris wheel, your position on the Ferris wheel changes, but you don't ever really get turned upside down. So if I want to get my A on top of my B, on top of my C, and on top of my D, I can hold down this button right here, which allows me to put those letters on the Ferris wheel and get them in the position that I want to put them in. This button right here is our reset button and it takes us back to just a flat orientation however we brought in. And now you can select OK to get out of the array window. The third editing option here within your fonts is a font style changing icon. So if I'm looking at this clean font and I think, man, that is not as fun as this person I'm embroidering for, the person I'm embroidering for is crazy, I need something more fun, I could simply select this little font changing button and it brings me to the first four fonts that are available to me. At that point, I can simply select a font and see it changing right on screen so that I can pick the style of font that I want. And again, I've got two pages to pick from, so I can toggle to the right to get to my second page. And there we have this really fun kind of hand-drawn, handwritten look of a font. And I like that font, so I'm gonna go ahead and select OK. So that's your font editing key that lets you change your fonts and it lets you preview them right in front of you. I love, love, love that feature. This right here is a spacing key. You can see the arrow pushing to the left and pushing to the right. So when you select your spacing key, you can space your letters apart from one another, or you can bring them in, or you can say, oh no, I've got them too close together. And right here is my reset button, which restores me back to the default distancing for how I brought my letters in. Okay, gets you out of this window. And let's talk about these two things right here. These two things are really cool ways to size your letters in different orientations. So I'm gonna start by actually selecting this last option. When I select this option, you'll notice that there is a large red box around my letter A. It is very, very popular these days to have a very large first letter and much, much, much smaller other letters. As I've done that and held my four-way bigger button down on my A, my A has gotten really big, whereas the B, C, D are all still at that medium where I had originally brought them in. So by doing this, we're also maintaining our base line. So everybody stayed as if we were writing on a lined piece of paper. The A just got bigger around that. Okay. Now let's talk about this editing option, and I find it easier to deal with this when we talk about dealing with monograms. So I'm gonna select my home button to take me home, and it says, is it okay to cancel this current pattern selection? Yes, it's okay, I don't wanna do this anymore. So I'm gonna select my fonts right here, and I'm going to select just a nice, again, I love that font, it's just a nice clean font. So the first letter of my name is K for Catherine, and I'm going to select medium because that way I don't overbuild 
My last name is Conti, so I'm gonna do the letter C for my last name. And my middle initial is M, and you're not getting that name out of me. So once I've got my three initials in there, I'm gonna go ahead and select set, and there they are on my screen. So in order to do a traditional monogram, your traditional monogram shape is smaller outside letters, bigger inside letter, your last name, and then again, smaller outside letters. So I'm gonna to go to my font editing key and we're gonna use this feature this time to talk about how to do that. So notice on this icon that letter A is separated from the letters B and C. So when I select that, I can use my knife to cut things apart. So notice over here, the knife is hovering between the K and the C, and there's a little dotted line in between them. So I'm gonna select my knife to separate. Now look, the K is on its own, but the box of selection is still around my C and my M. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my knife and cut my C apart from my M. So now I have three separate letters and I'm gonna go ahead and select OK. If I want to make this large letter in the middle, like a traditional monogram, I need to get back to that letter. The selection box is currently around my last letter, however. I don't like touching the screen because like I told you, I tend to move things out of position accidentally. This is a good place to use your selection button to select through or scroll through your design elements. So by touching it twice, I've gotten back over to my letter C and I'm gonna select OK to get out of this screen for now. So now that I'm there selected on my letter C, I can simply select size and I can make my C as big as I want to make it. I'm gonna wait till it beeps. Did you hear that? Beep, beep, it said. Beep, beep kind of tells me that's the maximum of where I can be. Now that I've gotten that C as big as I want, notice that the K and the M have disappeared underneath of it. However, the big deal is that letters are different and they are going to need to be dealt with individually. As far as like if I had the letter I in front of this, the letter I is going to have a different space than say the letter W or the letter M. So I'm gonna say okay to get out of my letter C and I need to select through to get to my letter K. So there I have my red selection box around the letter K and I'm going to select move and move my letter K straight to the left. This is a really good time to zoom in on your design. Remember I talked about that zoom in button earlier? So I've zoomed in 250% and I'm gonna scroll over to the left to see how close my K is to my letter C. And the first thing I can see is I'm not quite as far away as I would like. I tend to like to do about one dot line away. So I'm gonna go ahead and select OK to get out of my magnify key. And I'm going to just tick over a couple of times so that I've got a space that I'm comfortable with. If I like that amount of space, it's actually about a line and a half away. Now I can look to the right and I can see that I need some work on my M. So I'm gonna select OK to get out of my movement key, and I need to select the selection option to get over to the letter M. So there my letter M is selected, and I'm going to go to my move icon and move my letter M about two, about a block and a half away. So if I'm okay with that, I'm gonna select OK, get out of my zoom in button so that I'm back at 100%. Once again, the stitches inside the hoop, this is a really good way to get a realistic rendering of how this looks and how it's gonna appear as it's actually stitched down. So you'll notice this particular font, like on this letter M right here, you have little toggles at the bottom of the M and at the top of the M. Again, this is why each letter kind of needs to be dealt with individually, because that might mean I need to move closer to or further from the other letters because of those little toggles and how the letters appear on screen and that style of font and what it makes our sizing and spacing look like. So now that I've got my little KCM, I might want to save that to the memory of my machine so that I can pull that out and do my monogram all over everything that I have in my house, kitchen towels, bath towels, etc. So again, that's in the font editing key and that's where we are able to cut one letter apart from another. Okay, let's go back to one more thing as far as uh, multi-line text and font and font editing. So I'm going to start by going to my home screen. 
It gives me the error message. Is it okay to cancel this current pattern? Yes, it's okay. Okay, so let's talk about multi-line text. I'm gonna start by going to my regular fonts right here. So I'm gonna select my regular fonts. And here in my regular fonts, I'm gonna go ahead and select this first font, second font, I should say, my favorite font. And there we have our letters. So if I wanted to do Catherine is awesome on three different lines, I would start by selecting that first letter. And again, for multi-line text, it's kind of best to start either at medium or even at small if you'd like, but let's just go ahead and do medium. So you're going to type out your first word, and then you're going to hit your little enter button, which is down here. So I've selected enter. Now that first line of text has disappeared and it's showing me my second line of text, which I haven't typed anything in yet. So I had written my first word. So now I'm going to write my second word and I'm going to hit enter. And then I'm going to type my third word, F G H I. Now I cannot see line one or line two. However, down here, you do have a button that says check. So if you select your check button, it lets you check what you've written. So I have my Catherine is awesome. Everything is spelled the way I want it to be spelled. And I would simply select OK to get it on the screen back here. I have one more chance to delete if I had made a mistake. And I'm going to go ahead and select set to put that there on my screen. So it has given me evenly spaced, equidistant spacing for my first, second, and third lines of text, and everything is good to go there. So that's how we multi-line text, and that's just as easy as it is. Now let's talk about frames. I'm gonna start by going to my home screen. Yes, it's okay to get out of here, and now I'm back here on my home screen. So here from my home screen, I'm gonna go ahead and select this option right here. These are my frames. When you select your frames, you've got uh, 10 frame size shapes available to you. So let's say you wanted to put a shield around and maybe make some bunting. When you select that particular shape, you have three pages of outline styles available to you. This first outline style right here is looks like three lines side by side by side. They're actually not side by side by side. These three lines of stitching stitch on top of one another. So if I was to select that on the screen, it would look like one single line of stitching, but it's actually three lines of stitching on top of one another. You also have your satin stitching, then you have like a dashed stitching, little pointy peaky triangles. Let's look at page two. So here you have some more different um, outline styles for your frames. And then here on page three, this is actually these, this little lace one is one of my favorite frame styles. And then you also have blanket stitching. So if you wanted to do raw edge applique for embroidery, you could use a blanket stitch to sew your shapes down for you. I think that's a really cool feature. So once you have your particular frame shape with the outline style that you want, you select set. That takes you to your primary editing screen and your editing options that are here and available to you are the same as with any other embroidery design. Let's talk about retrieving our designs. You have two places that you can retrieve saved designs from. You can start by retrieving designs from your machine's memory pocket. There's a little pocket back there. So when we save it in, it's the pocket with the red arrow going in. And when you're pulling it out, you're going to select this icon. This icon takes me to my KCM, which is a design that I had saved because I want to monogram everything in my life. If I want to get this out and stitch with it, I'm going to select set and that's going to put it on my primary editing screen. However, if I'm done with KCM because I just got married and changed my last name, I can select my machine's memory pocket, select KCM and go ahead and delete that. It gives you a message. Is it okay to delete the selected pattern? If I select okay here, it truly does delete it right out of the machine because this is something I had put in there. Yes, it's okay, I'm done. And now KCM is not available to me 
to me anymore. If I was to select this design right here, this is the flip-flop design that I had done earlier. If I select delete, it gives me the same error message. Is it okay to delete the selected pattern? Yes, it's okay because it's deleting it out of the machine's memory pocket, but it's not deleting it from the machine because we had it here in this section. I think it was number 30. As I scroll through and look, you'll see there it is right there available to me to work on. So any of your built-in designs, those are not gonna be removed from your machine. But anytime you're in your machine's memory pocket where you have temporarily stored things, if you delete from in here, it just deletes it right out of your pocket and off of the machine's memory pocket, okay? Let's go back to the home screen and talk about the other way of retrieving designs, and that's from the USB stick. So you start by installing your USB stick onto your machine. Here on the right side of your machine, you've got a port, and your USB will just simply slide right on into that port. Once you've got your USB installed, give the machine a second to read that USB. You can't select the USB stick right away, just give it a second so they can start talking to one another. So now I'm gonna go ahead and select the USB stick and there I can see I have my sewing machine, the design that I want. So when I select that design, it's ready to go for me to set right onto my machine's embroidery screen. So if I have five of these little sewing machine ornaments I wanna do, again, I would just select this and it'll save it down into my memory pocket. I wanna show you one thing though. From your home screen, when you select that USB, once you select that design that you want, you actually have the option to save it right here right off your stick before you even move into your editing screen. So right here, if you select it now, it puts it right down into your machine, at which point it's safe to go ahead and remove the USB from your machine. So I would select set and I would remove my USB and there I am ready to work on my save design. Okay, that covers everything within editing and all of your embroidery editing features. So let's move over to sewing. So to begin on the sewing side, I want to start by talking about the buttons that are here on the face of the machine. First of all, over here to your left, you have your start stop button. When you don't have your foot pedal plugged in, you can use this to start sewing and to stop sewing. Notice that the light is red right now. That's because I have not chosen a stitch and my foot isn't down. Once I put my foot down, the light still doesn't turn green because I haven't chosen a stitch. So if I select a stitch, like let's say a straight stitch left needle position, it's ready to go. The light turns green to tell me that I am good to go. Next, you have your reverse button. If you tap your reverse button once, it'll take one stitch backwards or it'll take a locking stitch, depending on the stitch that you've chosen. If you hold the reverse button down, it will make a series of reverse stitches or locking stitches again, depending on the stitch that you've chosen. I wanna jump up for one second here to the tension knob. Honestly, for the most part, you can leave your tension alone at four. It's not like days of old. The machines are much more intuitive as to what they're doing. And in the last five years, I have not changed my tension, but you're welcome to if you need to, if you have a specific project. Down here, you have your needle up, needle down button. When you select it, it'll take the needle to another place from wherever it is. For instance, right now my needle is in the up position. If I was to tap this button, my needle would go down. If it was in the down position, I could tap this needle, uh, needle up position and it would bring my needle up. Here's your cutting button, which we all love, love, love. When you select this, it'll pull the threads down underneath and right behind the bobbin case area, there's actually a little razor that shoots across and cuts our thread for us. Remember, always cut on fabric, not on air. In other words, you need to have fabric underneath your presser foot when you select your cut button. Okay, right here you have a slider which does three different things this right now because we do not have a foot pedal plugged in this is the speed at which we are slow sewing 
Right now it's set on slow. So if I plug in the foot pedal and this is set on slow, this now acts kind of like a jockey holding the reins of my foot and it'll keep me from racing away from myself. Honestly, most of the time I like to put my speed at medium and that kind of keeps my foot from pressing on the foot pedal too hard, too fast, all at the start of whatever I'm doing and racing away from me. So again, with no foot pedal, that is the speed. With the foot pedal plugged in, this kind of acts like a jockey holding on to or managing the speed at which we're sewing. This also does a width control where it moves the needle from left to right. So let me show you where that is. Over here on the face of the machine, you have your operational menu. It's a dot and a line. So when I select my operational menu, I have eight pages where I can customize the machine and to work the way that I want it to. Right here at the top of page one, the very first editing option is width control. On the width control, you see here the little sliding toggle, which is exactly like what's over on the neck of the machine. If I turn my width control on, what it does is allow me to move my needle position from left to right. So the needle is moving from left to right by me taking a hold of my speed control and moving it over towards the right or over towards the left. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and select my width control and turn it off. Okay, so let's just talk about the buttons that we have here on the faceplate of the machine. I'm going to start here in the bottom right hand corner, our question mark. When you have a question, you would come to your question mark section. When you select your question mark section, there are eight basic help things. If you forget every single word that I have said in this video and it's important to remember them, you can go ahead and select, how did she say to put that bobbin in? There's nine pages that are kind of animated that show you how to do that. This is page one. How do I get to page two? I'm gonna come down to my toggle arrows and touch over to page two. Now it's on page two and it's giving me a little kind of animation of lift your foot. The next thing you need to do is to open up your bobbin case. Page four, you're going to drop your bobbin in, etc. If I'm done looking at how to put my bobbin in, I'm going to come to my return key here. That returns me to my previous screen, which of my eight basic help sections. If I touch return again, it takes me back to the screen that I was on before I went into my help section. Okay, again, down here, this option right here, the dot and the line that looks like a price and a menu item, because this is our operational menu. So when I select the operational menu, we have eight pages again of different things that we can customize to work the way that we want to work. Here on page one, the very first option is your width control, and I just went over that. The next option is fine adjustments vertical. So if you want to make little adjustments to your feed dogs and how they're feeding your fabric for your decorative stitches, you can come in and make little adjustments there. Honestly, I've never done that. I have to admit when I have a problem with how my things are working, I either try and sort it out by trying a different fabric or better stabilization, or I go and see my local technician. <laughs> This is twin needle. If you're going to be using a twin needle, you would put your twin needle mode on and that will gray out stitches that you can't use or that would get you into trouble by breaking your needle with a twin needle. Most of the time, you're probably gonna be sewing with the twin needle mode off. Let's go to the next page. So again, I'm going to use my toggle arrow to get to the right. Here it's asking me, do I wanna wake up and start off with my machine in the left needle position or in the center needle position? Left needle position is preferred only in terms of the fact that now you've got three sides of your fabric supported, as opposed to when you're sewing in the center, you only have your front and back of your fabric supported. So that's why out of the factory, the machines are now coming in a left needle position. All right, let's go to page three. Here on page three, this takes us into some of the embroidery operational stuff. Right now I'm looking at my editing screen with a four by four, or I could toggle to do my micro hoop. When I do that little small hoop, I can see the little, what I like to call the fence, the indication of the border of where that little micro hoop would be sitting. That way, as you're building out your design, you stay within your desired area. You can also look at your embroidery editing area in different ways. You have your blank screen, blank space, your blank canvas, or you could look at it with a red X in the center. You can look at it in quadrants, which I find very helpful. 
And sometimes for multi-line text, the grid view is very, very helpful because then you can make sure your lines of text are positioned where you want them. And then back to our blank canvas. Embroidery frame identification view is very helpful in terms of if I know that I only want to do a little tiny design, a little micro design, I can turn my embroidery frame identification view on and it'll gray out the designs that are too big for me to select with my micro hoop. So let's talk about that for one second. So I'm going to select the little micro hoop there and I'm going to select OK. So here we are on our home screen for embroidery and with our embroidery identification view on, when you go to select a design, again, it's graying out designs that are too big for you to use in the small frame. So I'd have to toggle to the next page and there I can see the first option available to me is this little guy right here. And once I set him on the screen, he's going to fit inside my embroidery editing area. When I go home, I can go back to my page three of my menu options. I'm going to take us back over to my four by four and I'm going to turn my embroidery frame identification view off. Let's go to page four. Okay, page four of the menu lets us pick name of color or color number and I went over that in embroidery. You can also choose inches or millimeters depending on where you're more comfortable seeing your size of your design displayed to you. Page five lets us choose our thumbnail size. So right now we're on a large thumbnail option. If I wanted from my home screen, when I go to select right there, I've got my large thumbnail option. If I go to my menu and I turn my thumbnail size to small and select OK, now you can see I've got nine thumbnails available to me to look at. Most of the time we like to see our designs nice and big though. So here on page five, we select our large thumbnail size and it'll give us a large view of our thumbnail. Right here and right here, we can change the colors that we are working on. So in other words, if we wanted to change our embroidery background color for editing, we could select this and turn it to, let's say pink. Okay. This is helpful in terms of the fact that I would often say to my daughter, hey, what do you think? And if my screen was white, she'd say, mama, our shirts are going to be pink. She couldn't picture her colors on top of pink shirts unless she saw a pink background to work on. Now over here on our thumbnails, you can see our thumbnails are white. So if I had a bunch of snowflakes designs, it'd be hard to see white snowflakes on a white background. So within your home screen, your uh, main operational menu there on page five, you would take your thumbnail and you would select it to be, oh, I don't know, let's do a dark blue. That way, when you're picking your designs, you could see your white snowflakes on a dark blue background. So these two options are only available to really help you either picture your designs on a background color like you're used to working with or to help you see the designs period by turning your thumbnails to a darker color right there. All right, let's go to page six. Here on page six, you can customize the machine to stop with the needle in the down position or the up position. Almost everybody prefers to stop in the down position. So when you turn corners and you lift your foot, your fabric doesn't go flying. I like to keep my buzzer on because it beeps at me and beeps at me loudly if I have a threading issue. I like to turn my opening screen off though, because once I've seen the pretty little slideshow, I don't need to see it again. I got to get to work when I turn my machine on. The next thing you have is English, or you could select another language if you'd like to just simply scroll through your options to find the language that you want. Let's go to page seven. So here on page seven, you can turn your bed light on or off. That just has to do with your bed lighting. And again, if you're doing tone on tone sewing, it might be helpful to turn your light off, but most of us like our light on and as bright as possible. If you feel like you're touching the screen and it's not reacting to you properly, you can walk through a series of prompts here that will change the input sensitivity. Honestly, I haven't had one machine in eight years that I've had to change the sensitivity on though. So that's there for you, but I've never had to do it because these machines are awesome. Let's go over to page eight. Here I can see that this little machine has stitched 4,641 stitches in its entire life. 
So I have two indications here, a service count and a total count. The service count is kind of like your tripometer. How many stitches have I've stitched on this machine since it was serviced? Your total count is the life of the machine. So those are the two things that are there for the technician. When they clear, clean your machine, they'll clear this number out to zero so that they can see how many stitches have stitched on it since they serviced it last. It's helpful information for them. This no or number is indicating the electronic components and printed circuit boards, the number that's uh, associated with those things. Again, that's more for your technician than anything you would need. And right away, you can see that you're at version 1.07. Sometimes there are updates available, just like any apps on your phone, update overnight or whatever. So occasionally you'll get an email from brother once you register your machine about updating your machine to a newer current version. That's it for the menu. That's eight pages of it. And we're done talking about the operational menu. So I'm gonna go ahead and select okay to get out of there. And let's go to our home screen for sewing. So here we are on our home screen for sewing. The first thing that I wanna point out is here in the left-hand corner, it shows you that the machine is turned on to be um, stopping with the needle in the down position. That's shown with the little arrow pointing down and the needle is slicing down through the fabric. So that's showing me I've got that set up that way because that's the way I want it. Now you've got eight pages here of like information or like stitches. So different kinds of stitches are grouped into different sections for you. For instance, if I was going to go into section number four, that's buttonholes and it's also darning loose darn, thick darn, this will sew on a button, and there you have your eyelet hole. So like information is grouped into certain areas of the machine. Your first option here is your utility stitches. So when you select your utility stitches, you'll notice your background here is blue. That's because these are our blue collar stitches. They're really getting the job done for us. However, if we were going to go into something more decorative, now you'll see you've got a gold background because these are glittery and sparkly and pretty stitches. So that's just a quick way to identify the different sections that you might be in. So let's go back to choosing this utility stitch key. So it wakes up through one through six stitches displayed, your first through your sixth utility stitch. Across the top of the screen, you've got your width adjustment, your length adjustment, and to left, right, or LR shift your needle adjustment. Now, there's a black background on all of these because these are set at default. So I've got stitch number 1-01 selected, and these are my default settings for that. So if I was to go over to, let's just do a zigzag here, number 1-8. On this particular one, these are my width, my length, and my left, right shift options available. If I want to edit any of these options, I'm going to do it in this editing button. Kind of think about sliding home. When you select that button, it takes you into the editing area. So with your width, you could make yourself a wider zigzag. And actually, as you're doing that, you can see it changing right on screen. That beep, 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 beep sound tells me there is no more width adjustment available. So again, in order to find my default setting, my black background, I can continue to scroll through. Or a very fast way of getting back to default, let's say I decided I wanted to go back to default, right here you have a reset button, which takes you back to your default setting. Okay, so that's your width option. The next option you have is your length option. If you want to, make it a longer stitch or a shorter stitch, you would do that here on your length. And again, you can reset to the default setting by selecting that option. Left, right, shift lets you move your stitch to the left or to the right. So this is a zigzag. I'm only gonna have a little bit of moving area, but I can move it. So it's gonna let me know when it's safe to go to the right and then it beeps at me when it's like, yep, I can't go any further. And the reset button takes us back to default. So I can make my zigzag stitch super wide and super narrow and create myself a nice long, sorry, short length wide width and now I have a satin stitch, all right? So these are ways that you can mess around and edit your stitches. 
me personally, let me show you one of the things I love about this machine. I do a lot of garments for my daughter. I like to sew clothes for her, costumes for her, whatever. I have not very good eyes, so I like to sew at a length of three. So I'm going to put the machine to a length of three. And because I do that for 90% of my sewing life, I like to actually save that stitch setting into the memory of my machine. So when I select that button there with the red arrow going down towards the needle, this lets me save that particular setting. So right here, I'm on my setting. So if I was to go do a triple stitch and wait, now I'm going back and doing garments. Every time I select that stitch, my sewing stitch that I use most of the time, it is customized and saved with my particular setting on it. And that doesn't go away. As a matter of fact, when I turn the machine off and turn the machine back on, it has woken up with my setting still in place. So if you select save here in this stitch editing area, it's actually going to save that setting for you so that because you always do that stitch like this, you can always do that stitch like this. If you need to make a temporary change, like, okay, I'm going to do something paper piecing and I need to change that length. I can simply select my stitch editing key, go down to something super short for paper piecing and say, okay. And now I can sew with my paper piecing. Okay. Wait, now I'm triple stitching. Okay. Wait, now I'm going back to my regular sewing and it goes right back to my saved setting because that is now the default setting because I'm made it so. When you're done with that, you get LASIK surgery. You can always reset to your default and resave it in. Whoever you saved in as your stitch setting, that's going to be the dominant boss and now the default setting of that particular stitch. What a great feature for this very inexpensive, awesome, awesome, awesome little machine. Okay, so that's the width, the length, the left, right shift, and the area where you can edit all of those particular functions. Down here, we have an automatic reverse and an automatic cutting feature. So let me show you what that looks like in action. Here, I've chosen left needle position with the reverse, and I'm going to select the automatic reverse so that when I start stitching, it'll automatically reverse for me. Okay, so let's see that in action. The machine comes forward, automatically reverses for you and starts to sew. And now at the end of the stitch, I simply tap my reverse button. It automatically reverses for me, comes back forward and pulls it down and stops with the needle in the down position. So that's the automatic reverse feature right there. However, you still have to select cut and then raise your foot to get your fabric out of there. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the automatic cutting. So I'm going to deselect the automatic reverse. If I touch the automatic cutting, it highlights both of these options for me. So now this time it's going to automatically reverse at the start for me. And when I'm done and I tap my reverse button, it will cut for me. So let's see what that looks like. I'm going to go ahead and select start. It comes forward. It reverses for me. When I get to the end, all I have to do is tap my reverse button. It automatically reverses and comes back forward for me and it cuts. So I can just lift and pull my fabric out. I don't have to select my cut button. That's what it looks like. Okay, so down here in the bottom right corner, we've got two more editing options on this page. This one actually isn't really an editing option. It just lets me get a good look at my stitches in action. So right here, I can see that I've chosen the zigzag stitch and I'm supposed to have my J foot on. Additionally, this is a realistic 100% rendering of my zigzag stitch. That's letting me know that on my fabric, this is exactly what the stitch is going to look like. I can change the color of my stitches here in case I'm having trouble seeing what they look like from blue is the default to red or black. And I can also zoom in on the stitch to get a better look at what that stitch is going to look like as it's formed. Okay, gets you out of this screen. So that's my little stitch viewing 
or preview type of window. And over here, we've got a stitch editing key as well. So in the top right hand corner, this lets you edit the width, the length and the left right, left right shift of your needle. And down here in the bottom right hand corner, there's even more editing available to you on these stitches. So first of all, you've got mirror imaging. Let's see what that might look like. Let's pick a stitch that has a mirror imaging capability to it. Hmm, I think I might need to go to another menu. Okay, so I'm gonna select menu number two and I'm gonna choose this little blanket stitch. So once I've chosen that blanket stitch, you'll notice that the, the line is on the right and the tines reach over to the left. If I go to my stitch editing key and I mirror image it, it flips to where the line is on the left and the tines are on the right. This option right here will start fresh at the beginning of a stitch as you turn the corner. That is something that you might use when you're in your, oops, let me go here. Right here, when you're in this particular decorative area, let's say I was in the middle of stitching this beautiful little satin stitch and I got to the end and I wanted to turn my corner. I'm going to go into that stitch editing key and I'm going to select this which makes a sound, beep, beep, um, and that just lets me know that I've done it so that it'll start at the beginning of the pattern as opposed to starting wherever I ended a minute ago. So that's a start fresh key. Here in your basic utility settings, you also have continuous versus single. And honestly, I'm not entirely certain I would be doing that within my utility settings. I find that a wonderful editing key in terms of this area of decorative stitches. So I could choose to have a single S, oops. I could choose to have here a single S and then I can return out of this screen and maybe I can add this little bar and then make it continuous. So what does that look like? I have a preview window there and I've got my little S with my bar and my little S with my bar. So I've just created my own custom stitch using one star for single and continuous meaning that it'll do the S, the bar, the S, the bar, the S bar continuously until I touch reverse or stop cutting and stop sewing. So, okay, that is the single versus continuous. Again, you can see it here in the decorative stitch area and you can also see it here in the utility stitch area. So that's the end of the editing there in the utility stitch area. Let's go on and move to some of the fun stuff we can do with our decorative stitches. So from the home screen, I'm gonna go ahead and select, let's do option number five. Here in this little tab right here, we've got some heirloom sewing and some decorative sewing. So let's go ahead and pick this little candle wicking stitch right here. So once we've chosen that stitch, let's go to the stitch editing key. And here we can see we've got our mirror imaging available to us. We've got our, um, this is our start fresh where it's gonna start fresh on the corner or the turn instead of half way through the stitch, it will start right at the beginning of a stitch and your single versus continuous. Now right here, I can see that I have a gray icon. That means there's no more editing left in this particular section of stitches. So let's go to number six. And I'm gonna select six, four, and let's see what stitch editing we have available to us. Okay, there it is, there's an editing option. This is a density key. So the first one is the default setting. It always starts off there. It's a fairly loose stitch, but I could select the more dense version and it beefs it out. And you can actually see that right on screen. So there's the less dense version might be appropriate for Batiste. And then here's a more dense version, something I might wanna put on denim. And again, because I've chosen this really thick satin stitch, it's telling me that I need to have my N foot on the machine so that my decorative stitches can pass underneath that foot under the channel that is performed there on the bottom of the foot. That's wonderful foot for decorative stitches. Okay, let's see what other editing options we have available to us. I'm gonna go here to number seven to the satin stitches and select that and let's see what we've got available. 
So here in the satin stitches, again, you've got mirror imaging, you've got pattern start fresh at the beginning, and you have one versus continuous, single versus continuous. The other option you have here with your satin stitches is you can change the length of a particular pattern. So I have a customer that does dolly and me dresses. So she does the dolly scallop, just a nice tiny little scallop, and then you can increase it to do the me dresses for the little girl. So the length of the pattern is now significantly longer. Another cool thing you can do if you wanna play here in this area is you could do a length of one on one of the scallops, and then you could return to this main screen, select that option again. Now you'll see I've got two of them. Go back to your stitch editing option. You can take the second one to a length of five, and now you can make that continuous. So what does that look like? Well, now I have one little scallop that's narrow, and then I have a long scallop. So you can create your own stitch way by changing the length of a particular pattern and using the single versus continuous editing options. Let's return out of there to the main screen. In this last section, you have cross stitches. And when you select a particular cross stitch, there really isn't any more editing. Again, this button is gray, which means you're going to get what you get when you do a cross stitch. It is what it is. Okay. That's it for your home screen for sewing. This is our J foot as indicated by the letter behind the snap on bar. So the J foot is our standard utility zigzag presser foot. This foot is really good because you've got a clear view here and you've got three notches to indicate left needle, center needle and right needle positions. This is our end foot or our decorative stitch foot and sometimes it's referred to as the monogramming foot. On this particular foot, there is no metal across the center of the presser foot. It allows you a nice clear view into what you are stitching. Now the big difference between the end foot and the J foot happens on the back of the feet. Let's look at that. So here we have side by side our J foot, our utility zigzag foot and our decorative stitch foot. So the differences between the feet are actually quite obvious. Even though the opening where the needle will do its stitches is exactly the same size opening, the J foot is longer, helping the fabric to grab faster under the feed dogs. But the end foot is wider. This allows the fabric to have more of it held into position while the decorative stitches are forming. The real difference though is on the back of the feet. When I turn the feet upside down, you can see the end foot actually has a channel that goes from the front to the back, which allows the buildup of denser satinish type of stitches to slide through without getting stopped by being pushed on at the foot and uh, feed dog area as it would have done on the J foot. This is the G foot. The G foot is there for overcasting. Overcasting is a stitch that will seal the edges if you've got fabrics that fray. If you look at the G foot, along the length of the foot, there's kind of a right side and a left side to this foot. Along the right side of the foot, there's a flange that comes around that will balance your fabric or brace your fabric. Let me turn that foot over for a second and let's look at the back of it. There's actually a tiny little piece of metal on that flange that hangs down beneath the foot where you can brace your fabric right up against the edge of that flange. So let's see what that looks like. When I place my fabric underneath the G foot, the overcasting foot, that fabric can actually push against that little flange that hangs beneath the foot. So when you're putting your fabric there, you're gonna butt right up against that little flange and place your foot down. So here with this overcasting stitch, the thread forms over the edge of your fabric and that way it helps contain or encase 
the edge of your fabric so that the fraying will not happen. So this is our R foot for blind hemming. You'll notice on this foot, there is a very large metal flange, which we're gonna brace our fold of our fabric up against in order to create that blind hem. Let's look at how that works. With a blind hem stitch, the bulk of the stitches forms on the right side of this fold. So you're going along and it stitches along here, leaps over and takes just a teeny tiny little nip of the folded fabric, comes back over to this side, sews along, leaps over and takes a nip, comes back over and sews along. So the important thing is to put that fold of your fabric right up against that metal flange and to sew slow enough so that when you're watching it here that you watch the needle take a nip of the fold. Also, you're going to be making that letter Z in order to create that blind hem there. So it comes over and forms the letter Z. So that's how we're gonna do the blind hem. Let's see what it looks like. Leap, watch it, nip, back over, nip. So you wanna just grab one or two threads. You don't wanna have railroad ties on the other side of your fabric. And obviously you would match your thread color. So this is the inside of your fabric where the outside is my little nips. So to create that blind hem, you're folding up the bottom of your fabric, the hem of your fabric, because you wouldn't want to have raw edges showing. Then your fabric gets folded on top of that so that the fold and the edge of the fabric has about a quarter of an inch. That creates the letter Z, and that's how we do a blind hem. The eye foot is your zipper foot. And depending on whether you're feeding in the left side of your zipper tape or the right side of your zipper tape, you're gonna snap your foot on either side accordingly. This is the A foot or the buttonhole foot. Your machine will form a perfect size hole because you can slide open the end of the buttonhole foot, place your button in the end and pinch it down. Right here between these two flanges, there's a buttonhole lever which will pull down and it will sew the perfect size hole for the button because the diameter is measured here at the end of the A foot. Let's see how that works. To install the A foot, this portion of the foot is quite high, so if you lift up, it'll give it some extra height in order to clap down on that bar. Then you need to pull down your buttonhole lever. So that lever needs to go down in between the two arms of the foot so that it will trigger as it hits the back and hits the front to tell the machine, I need to sew back, wait, I need to go to the front, wait, now I need to go to the back. So you get that perfect buttonhole. So you'll mark the placement of your buttonholes on your fabric. When you go to slide the fabric now under the presser foot, you'll see that mark inside the opening on your presser foot. When you put your foot down, I like to have the fold of my fabric along the right side of my foot, and I like to be able to see inside that opening my line of where I've indicated my buttonhole needs to start. I also like to have that line just in front of the red marks on the inside of my foot. Also, to know where the center of your buttonhole is, where you're going to be slitting open your buttonhole, there's a center red mark on your presser foot as well.
When removing your buttonhole foot, you're gonna drop your foot down just like you've done all of the other presser feet. However, at this point, you need to remember that the buttonhole lever needs to be slid back up inside the machine, all the way at the highest position. So this is the M foot. This is your button fitting foot. This is the foot that you use that'll allow you to sew a button into position. You're gonna start by positioning your button as best as you can underneath this little blue rubber part of the foot. You're gonna have the holes of the button as close to the corners of the M foot as possible so that the stitch can pass back and forth. When you start stitching, you're gonna to wanna to make sure by checking your needle clearance, is my needle in the clear on the one side? Yes. And then keep turning your hand wheel till the needle goes down into the second hole. Now you can see that you're clear and you can go ahead and select start and it'll sew the button on for you. Raise your presser foot and pull your piece out. I'd like to show you how to install the walking foot. You're gonna start by removing whatever foot you have on the machine. Once you've dropped that off, now you need to remove the presser foot holder or ankle. So if you have your disc-shaped screwdriver, you're gonna start by righty-tighty, lefty-loosey, loosening the bolt on your presser foot holder so that it falls off. Once your presser foot holder is removed, your walking foot is going to slide right around that bolt, but you have to do two things at once. You're also gonna to need to install the claw of your walking foot up over your needle bar. So the claws around the needle bar, I'm gonna loosen this bolt just a little bit. Once you've got the claw around the needle bar, you're going to bring that walking foot forward right through the bolt and then you're going to tighten the bolt to hold the walking foot, foot directly to the shaft of the machine. Your walking foot is gonna help you manage multiple layers of fabric. Okay, so that wraps up today's video and I hope that you learned a lot. So the Brother LB5000S and the Brother LB5000M are available here at the Sewing Studio Fabric Superstore, as well as the Sewing Studio at Lady Lake. Please stop by and ask us questions. We are happy to help. We also have this machine available online on our website, www.sewing.net, and we can get you started there with questions as well. So that's it. I hope that you take this instruction and take off and sew with it. Bye-bye, everybody.